Sure. Did you have a um, PowerPoint at all to share tonight? Not really. I okay. just was not, yeah, not feeling That's it. All right. That's all right. However you want to present is good with me. <laughs> um, I mean, some of the slides that I had last time, I mean, I, I might bring those up. Um, okay. But they're, uh, they're the same ones, a uh, couple of them. And then uh, the rest I have. Sure. In front of you? <laughs> yeah. In front of your mind? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hard to remember all this stuff off the top of your head, you know. <laughs> for sure. So. Um, hi, guys. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to give it one more minute, and then we'll get started. Wonderful. And I am recording, if that's okay again. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Yeah, my staff like to uh, find this and send it to me just because they're like, here, you need to listen to yourself. I'm like, no. <laughs> I never listen to one recording of myself. <laughs> Why is it that we all can't stand our, the sound of our own voice? It's like, that's not me. It's not, no. I don't know. I don't know why, it's so weird. All right, I'm gonna get going. So okay. hi everyone, thank you for coming to part three of our trauma series with Teresa Yelling from OSF Trauma Recovery Center. Um, I'm gonna be very brief tonight. My name is Danielle Angelari and I'm the executive director of NAMI Northern Illinois. We are an affiliate of the National Alliance on Mental Illness and we serve Winnebago and Boone counties here in the Northern Illinois region. We offer tons of support, education, advocacy, um, resources. Um, if you ever need any updated support group list or education course list um, or any, if you need to touch base with any other resources in regards to mental health care, please feel free to reach out, reach out to us, share your email with me here. Um, Oops. Be happy to help however I can. <laughs> So we do have one more education program before we take a little summer break um, between July and August. So next Tuesday at 5.30 over Zoom as well, we'll be listening to a representative from Swedish American talk about the mobile integrated healthcare for behavioral health pilot that they've been working on. So that'll be interesting, bring your questions. Um, and as for questions, if you guys do have anything you'd like to ask Teresa tonight, you can put it in the chat box and I'd be happy to facilitate at the end of the program. Thank you all. Turning it over to you. Thank you. Now, oh, there we are. I'm like, where am I? I got like three screens and I'm <laughs> Now I would like to share real quick one of the screens. So Oh, I think I got it. I think this might be it. Do you see it? All good. Okay. So how are we treating PTSD and complex trauma? Thank you again for having me uh, do sort of this uh, three-part series. It's a lot of information to go through. And, uh, you know, I, I welcome any questions or comments or anything. So please feel free to reach out um, even during if you have questions. Um, but there's just, it's just so much. And, uh, you know, and, and to go through it yourself, to have issues of PTSD and issues of complex trauma, I, I can't even imagine how hard that is to go through because just explaining these things um, can be quite exhausting in itself. So um, we wanna give you know, folks that have this issue or these issues, these symptoms, a lot of uh, compassion and understanding uh, when we're trying to help folks. And that's anyone really, but you know, as I was going through all of this, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is such a mouthful and I apologize. <laughs> so 
But um, I mean, literally we could do days and days and days on just PTSD or just complex trauma. Um, and so, uh, and then how do, you, how do you really treat that? So first um, wanting to just uh, say that, uh, let's see if I can get my mouse to, to work here. That would be awesome. Okay, it won't go over. Oh, there we go. Um, that I um, that OSF uh, was able, you know, able to get a um, grant to start a trauma recovery center in Peoria like about four years ago or so now, uh, and I think they decided that well. Rockford might benefit from having a trauma recovery center. So we, uh, well, I wasn't here yet, but uh, um, the Rockford uh, St. Anthony's decided to go ahead and write this grant and with the help of Peoria and we, we were awarded and that's how I sort of got involved was I was hired, thank goodness, um, and very grateful for being hired. I think uh, even though uh, this community is hesitant maybe to work with OSF because they don't have an, you know, a designated department for behavioral health, I have to say that uh, they've been extremely supportive and really understand the need for this trauma recovery center. And that's so exciting to see. Um, we really uh, want to make sure that we're trying to remove all barriers for the services that people may need so that they can really try and recover from the PTSD and um, and really, or, and or the, I should say, complex trauma. I mean, we really want to be able to do that. Um, so we, um, oops, messing around here. Um, so the services that we provide, therapy, counseling, case management, advocacy, aggressive outreach, I always say that's sort of our secret weapon. Um, and it's um, where Kira, our uh, secret weapon outreach person, she just does an outreach to, uh, like agencies or other doctors or whatever, she reaches out actually to our clients um, and tries to see um, who uh, may need extra support or um, uh, how can we, maybe there's a barrier to uh, receiving some type of service in some way. So, you know, because we know uh, clients that have this level of trauma, they're not necessarily consistent with therapy. Uh, if you get too close, it gets too hard or it gets too scary. It, it's hard to do the work. And sometimes when we think we're ready to plunge in there and do the work, we're not. It, it, it can be extremely difficult. And so we want to really try and support our clients to you know, meet them where they're at. If they start and they can't go through, that's okay. We, we understand that, you know, but then we say to you, well, we're always here. So when you are ready or maybe you're not and you just need to call and talk, to, okay, but we're here. And we really wanna let the community know that as well. Um, our staff are specially trained in trauma. Um, most of our therapists, hopefully here soon, will all be uh, certified as trauma experts. Um, when we talk about, when I say that, that's providing the therapy to really work with folks who have trauma. And all our services are provided for free. Um, the eligibility, they must be a resident of Winnebago County. They need to be 14 years of age or older. They must be a victim or a witness of a violent crime. And we say victim because that is the way it is written uh, in the grants and whatnot. But here we look at it as a survivor um, and you're trying to survive and 
get through um, life with these horrible, debilitating maybe symptoms and it gets in your way. And so we want to just say that we respect that you've made it thus far, um, but how can we help you get even further and without you know, so uh, much strain and stress and fear. Um, and that you're currently experiencing these symptoms of PTSD um, and you're currently not receiving mental health counseling services. So let me just say that um, you may uh, have mental health services, let's say through Rosecrans and you see that maybe once a month but you're not really working on, or, or even month or every other week even, or weekly, but you're not specifically working on the PTSD issue, um, then we would go ahead and work with someone who has another therapist, but it's because they're doing something completely different. Um, because our work is about the trauma. It is specific to that and, uh, you know, not to say that we can't talk about other things or that we don't talk about other things. We do because it's all sort of <laughs> incorporated. You have to tease all the, the elements out. Um, and so, but we just want to make sure that folks aren't like, oh gosh, but I have this or I have that. At some point too, we, we should have um, a nurse practitioner helping with um, uh, psych services. But again, uh, in this area, we know that many people that are on Medicaid, for instance, will use Rosecrans for their psych needs, um, psychiatry needs, I should say, and, uh, and or their regular um, general practitioner. And that's okay. We don't want to take away from that. So uh, we would support that and hopefully just work with whoever that uh, person is that's providing those psych services and, and helping them understand what we're seeing on a weekly basis since that person isn't seeing you uh, maybe on a weekly basis. So those are just some of the things that I think are important to know. So this is the contact information um, and please uh, feel free to call at any point. Um, we are usually here like 8.30 to 5 or 8 to 4.30, somewhere in there. At some point when we have enough clients, we will be doing groups in the evening, uh, usually, I think. Um, and depending on the group, if we have to have a facilitator, maybe they would be done during the day. Uh, but uh, you can always email us or even send a referral through our TRC referral at osfhealthcare.org. Again, anyone would be happy to help you and talk with you about our services. Um, so we talked about trauma, traumatic event. It's an incident that causes physical, emotional, spiritual, or psych and or psychological harm, it should say. You know, the person experiencing the distressing event may feel physically threatened or extremely frightened as a result, which makes sense. Um, but when we look at uh, PTSD before and you know I went through all of that and what is complex trauma and how do we you know how do we really treat all of these things and how do we know what's the difference and you know here with PTSD and complex PTSD symptoms you can see that you know both have maybe re are re-experiencing in their mind that trauma over and over and over again. And so therefore they both may avoid, uh, you know, like I said, if, if they unfortunately were stabbed at the corner of, you know, Mulford and State, or um, then they're never, they don't want to go past there. They're, they're just, you know, they're like, I, I, no, not going there. I'm going to avoid that or avoid people that they were with, you know, anything that will be a reminder. And they always have that sense of threat uh, that they're going to be harmed in some way. But as you can see, the complex PTSD continues to go along with, you know, uh, more symptoms, the affect, dysregulation of their emotions. They cannot regulate their emotions. They are all over the place. 
They have a very negative self concept. Here's the biggest difference is that someone with complex trauma or complex PTSD, which again, we cannot diagnose as of yet because they haven't added that to the DSM, but yet they know they need to blah, blah. But you, you actually try to own the, the trauma and saying, I caused it. I am the problem. I'm awful. I'm disgusting. I, you know, it's not, whereas like if you were robbed and you were, you know, stabbed or shot at, and that was your first time experiencing a trauma, uh, you may blame yourself for maybe you were walking at night and you knew you shouldn't have been out. Okay. But you don't take on a negative self-concept of your whole core being, you know, that there is really something wrong with you and why are you even here? So we will see, you know, um, self-harm and suicide attempts. Um, I mean, it's, it's truly hating themselves. Um, and then interpersonal disturbances. So uh, not able to really um, be assertive. They're maybe aggressive, uh, maybe getting into fights. They can't regulate their anger. You know, they go from zero to 60 and, and I mean, they're there before you can go, you know, say hello. I mean, it's, it, they're done. Um, they don't uh, know how to set boundaries. They don't uh, know how to like cope with conflict and conflict is looked at as always a negative uh, and a problem, and then it's anger, and then having to do, and sometimes they're passive aggressive too. That's always fun. Um, and so those things are, are a big issue. Now, again, like I've told people numerous times, I think in each one of these presentations, and I'm going to say it again, there is a huge problem, I think around the country, but definitely from what I see in Rockford is that many people who do diagnosing, so therapists, psychiatrists, doctors, um, misdiagnose uh, complex PTSD and they put down bipolar with borderline. Not to say that they don't have those features. They do, but that isn't the complete and holistic look at that person. Until you know uh, a person's history of trauma, are you really able to uh, make a very, you know, uh, a better diagnosis, I would say. Um, so again, you see the PTSD, the complex trauma, um, but with borderline personality disorder, there isn't that sense of threat per se. Um, and they're not trying to avoid anybody or anything. Um, they do the push pull thing where they want you. Now they don't Now they want you now they don't. And, and it's like whiplash. And you, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it, it can get very exhausting sometimes when people are really, uh, not able to, um, regulate themselves. They just, they, they're not necessarily doing this on purpose. They, they really don't know that they're doing it sometimes. Um, and it's not necessarily that their trauma or that they've even had trauma per se, um, or an event or an exposure to something. Um, they could have maybe just learned this or picked it up DNA wise um, or environment whole wise. I mean, you know, but they can't regulate. They, uh, they do have a very negative self-concept, but there, but you can see there's no trauma that's really happened per se. Um, they have a shifting self-identity. They, they shift with the wind, whoever's around, that's who they are. Uh, and everybody is either all good or all bad. Uh, so whoever they're following that day, they're all good. The next day, they're all bad. 
um, avoidance of real or imagined abandonment. So in a relationship with someone and you are late coming home and that person thinks that you left them and they're like, where have you been? You're like, I was at work. I'm like 10 minutes late. What's, what's the big deal? And they're like, I, I thought, I, I thought you weren't going to come back ever. And, and, and why did you have to be gone that long? I mean, you, you sit there and you're like, what is, what is the problem? I mean, people are late all the time, especially me, huh? late all the time. They really imagine that everybody is abandoning them at some point. And so that's where this push pull thing it can come from too, is I'll push you away first. No, I want you back. Um, and they may disassociate and be paranoid. Um, and when you get to these places, um, the paranoia is um, again tied with um, sensory issues, usually that can be that can trigger that paranoia. Um, disassociation is where you're actually trying to not feel anything. I mean, you're you're not here. You're somewhere else. Um, and so you're not aware of any senses whatsoever. It's, you're not here. So um, we want to embrace change. So one of the things that, you know, I talked about is, you know, the complex trauma, it's a result of learned and effective beliefs and behaviors that can be, you know, replaced with like a positive mindset and health promoting behaviors. You know, and I said, yes, we want to remove yourself from the primary um, or, you know, the, the, or the situation or the secondary situation um, where this abuse is happening. A lot of times we really can't do that. That's, you know, um, can be more dangerous if we're talking about, you know, uh, domestic violence for children um, or teens or whatever. I mean, they can't just get up and go wherever they want. Um, but we talk about seeking therapy, uh, talking about it, writing about it, meditate. So doing some self-care, obviously all of this is really self-care. Medications, if need be, doing some physical exercise, rewriting the script of your life. So what does that all mean? Well, first, if you're ready for therapy, you think you're ready for therapy, the therapist really needs to talk with you and go in depth about, um, you know, the, about the assessment piece. Now, usually an assessment is about an hour. I mean, especially for insurance companies. I mean, they, you can sometimes extend it um, and try to get paid for an extended time if you can show that it was a very complex uh, assessment. And that's why it took longer than 75, I think longer than 90 minutes or something like that. You can put complex. But for our program, we actually are allowed up to about four hours to do an assessment because we're doing a number of tools that actually uh, can trigger a lot of different, you know, emotions, the dysregulating, all of this. And so, um, we do tools on, you know, PTSD, um, also the um, Carlson, which is, you know, a lifetime of trauma. And that sometimes can take two sessions to get through. I mean, it's, it, it's pretty in depth and we have to really try and get them through that. And then also at the same time, before, during and after, you have to really work with them on safety for themselves, security for themselves. Um, I think, and, and like intervention. So an emotional safety plan is really what's important here. Who can you count on to talk to? How can you regulate your emotions right now? And this is difficult because here you're being triggered and now you're supposed to be able to cope differently? Well, okay, sure. Well, that's, I mean, this is why, you know, we're saying, okay, if you're ready, you gotta go through the yuck to get to the other side. And the yuck is, is yucky. 
it's it's difficult. This is not easy. Um, and facing your fears, I mean, that's anybody and everybody. Facing our fears, it's difficult. No doubt about it. That's why we try to keep our fear, you know, our fears locked up somewhere in a closet and just pretend, you know, Wizard of Oz, pretend like it's <laughs> He doesn't, he, he, what's behind the curtain doesn't matter. You know, it's like, no, it does. Um, but then also our goal when working with the clients is, the biggest goal is to reduce these, you know, these maladaptive um, behaviors and symptoms that are causing problems for you to live a healthy life, um, a positive life. And so, um, we have to get that person to make decisions that create, you know, like balance within like uh, we call seven dimensions of wellness. So if you look at, we have like a, and I'm sorry, I didn't have this on the, on um, the PowerPoint, but there's actually a wheel that talks about your individual wellness and it, and it looks at emotion intellectual wellness, physical wellness, social, environmental, financial, spiritual, you know, they want you to have some type of balance. And believe me, as a, as a social worker who's a helper and this, and you think I'm good at all of this? No. Uh, in fact, we're probably some of the worst people uh, to <laughs> sometimes take care of ourselves because it's, it's tough to just stop and do these things um, or pay attention, but it certainly is something to strive towards. And I think we all try and do that, but we all, we all need the support. We all need, you know, the people that we can call or talk to, um, but you want to be able to help them uh, regulate their emotions, um, feed their mind intellectually. Um, maybe even, you know, sometimes doing something creative and learning something new uh, that maybe they never did before and wanted to, they were interested. Um, and it, for me, it was learning how to do that paint pouring um, that I would see. And, and literally I would sit there and just stare at it like, oh, you know, like back in the day with the lava lamps, <laughs> and you just stare at it, you know? Well, this really helped me to get centered by then doing it and watching the colors and how it just didn't turn black, you know, one big puddle of brown and black. And that's it. No, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous um, and unique. Every one of them is unique. So for me, it's, it's learning that. So stretching that mind, physical, well, I need to do this. My boss will tell you that I, I, if I have to walk across this, you know, field over here, I'm about ready to die. And it's ridiculous. I mean, and I have a five-year-old that I should be chasing around because he wants me to. And I'm over there going, are you kidding me with this? But physical is extremely important. Social. <laughs> Hello, pandemic. How can we be social? They kept telling you to reach out to folks, call people get online and reach out and do the Zooms and the this and the that. We are social beings. If we are, and we know this from when uh, uh, prisons have been challenged when they would put people in isolation, it drives us nuts. It makes us see things. It it's, it's deprivation of all senses really. And it's, it's obviously torturous. So we said, you can't do that. Even though some places still do that, we're saying, no, it, that's torture. Um, and that's not okay. And so being social and having that support is very important. That's why group uh, therapy is very important too for some folks. Um, environment, what's your room look like? What's your office look like? Your house, your, <laughs> my car, oh, back in the day, uh, it resembles how you feel. So hoarders, if you watched hoarders, 
and you walked in, you could tell there was some mental health issues because why do we need to save, you know, this little, you know, this paper, you know, that we see 5,000 times and not throw it away. What is it that you, you need? can't throw that away? I might need that someday. There is definitely some mental health issues there. And so decluttering your room, always recycling, these are, these are important things. Volunteering to clean up an environment, but environmental also is who's around you in your environment. That also uh, is created by you. And if, you know, as an adult, right? Um, but who your friends are, do you have boundaries with your family that may be very unhealthy? And that's difficult, very difficult to do. Um, you know, when I've done therapy with folks and they're not ready to cut family out because maybe they should, and you know, quote unquote should, but we have to at least learn how to have boundaries so that we can still regulate our emotions and be able to live our lives in, in the healthiest way possible. Because cutting out family is not always the best thing to do, even though an outsider looking in, it's like, oh my gosh, they are so unhealthy. Uh, they, they, you know, maybe there's drugs, alcohol, um, violence, constant, I get it. But maybe that's the only lifeline they've got right now. Uh, and, and, and we can't just cut that off. We just need to have boundaries. Um, financial wellness. So taking steps to live within your financial means. Uh, that can be difficult when you have nothing, you know, and you're homeless on top of all of this. Or, you know, there's, there's definitely um, extenuating circumstances circumstances that make trauma worse, complex trauma worse, drugs, alcohol, homelessness, poverty, um, lack of healthy foods, um, lack of education or opportunity to be educated. Uh, you know, those things are extremely important and spiritual. Spiritual wellness is not necessarily always about religion, um, and needing to be a part of a religious organization. Um, but it's about thinking and knowing that there is something much bigger than yourself out there somewhere. And that you need to ask and explore those things. Uh, and maybe it's the mother earth Maybe it's the universe, uh, maybe it is God. And, the, you know, it, it can be all of those. It can be none of those. It can, you know, but it, it needs to be something bigger than yourself. And um, sometimes just being with nature is extremely important. It can help, quote unquote, ground us. And um, so we want to look at individual wellness. If this is our goal, you know, then how do we get there? Um, well, there's several, several therapies that therapists can use. I know that people have probably heard of cognitive behavioral therapy, where we do a lot of challenging of negative beliefs and trying to reframe. So reframing those, uh, you know, uh, statements that we say to ourselves, you know, like, my life is absolutely horrible. I wish I could, you know, I wish I was dead. And then we go, well, wait a minute. You know, um, it sounds like you have this person that loves you, this person that, you know, so starting to challenge some of those things, you know, um, and, and then putting that twist on it, it, it can hopefully help break down this negativity and start to be like, well, okay. So sometimes we have people do what a great, um, a journal writing down things that they're grateful for three things they are grateful for each day, because then you're looking for the positive instead of the negative. That's difficult. I think, uh, again, through this pandemic, it's been very difficult for folks. Um, and some not, not so much because they're like, well, I've had a job this whole entire time. And I'm very grateful. I could, I could have been, you know, 
da 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 whatever had happened or didn't happen. We do exposure therapy. Exposure therapy, uh, again, you, you need to be extremely ready. And you gotta, it's sometimes it's pushing someone a little past that fear threshold where they wanna like run and hide. So um, if we look at that uh, you were stabbed at a certain, like, like I said, Milford and State, let's say you're stabbed there and you won't go near that place. We might at least drive together to that, just drive past and then talk about the feelings and then try to ground that brain to say, okay, am I safe? What's going on? I mean, it's really working through all of that um, and, and taking that time to do that. Um, it's difficult. It really is difficult for people. Um, they say cognitive processing therapy, you know, um, you're challenging those memories uh, of the trauma. Is that really true? I mean, could you at three years old defended yourself against your father or your mother or your older cousin? Could you really? No, you were three years old. Of course, you know, they took advantage of you. You know, there was nothing that you could do. You know, but you've survived. You know, so challenging some of those things because really it's irrational and a lot of the thoughts that we take on uh, especially through trauma. DBT, uh, so dialectical behavioral therapy, which really is, you know, it's, 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 it comes out of cognitive behavioral therapy. However, they added, you know, the whole mindfulness thing. Boy, is that a big, geez, a big thing right now. Mindfulness, mindfulness. You hear this all the time. Now, it's the big word of the day, it seems like. Um, before I was meditation there for a while. Now it's mindfulness, blah, blah, blah. Um, but this was created back in, I think, the late 70s, early 80s with the whole my, you know, mindfulness and really trying to help folks um, with emotional regulation. Um, and what it is, is also putting them in distress and getting them to tolerate being, well, stressed, anxious, and, and saying, okay, just, we're, we're gonna do this just for one minute, you know? And they're like, oh my God, I'm gonna die, I'm dying. You know, they, they literally think they're dying. And we know that because many people go to the ED, the emergency department thinking they're having a heart attack and it's anxiety. Uh, and so it, it's, it's a tough thing. You know, interpersonal effect effectiveness too, it's, it's really helping folks to learn about being assertive, setting boundaries, um, coping with conflict. How can you have conflict with folks? I think everybody in the whole United States probably needs it. It's okay that we disagree. It's, it's quite all right. But uh, can, we, can we talk about that? You know, um, and maybe sometimes walking away is just okay. Like maybe you don't need to confront that person because it just doesn't matter. Um, EMDR, so the eye movement, uh, um, uh, sort of eye therapy, and I can't remember what the D um, stands for, darn it, uh, regulation, but that is where they're doing a lot of trying to have you come up with a memory that is traumatic and doing a lot of moving the eyes, doing the tapping, because again, we're doing some sensory sorts of things to kind of maybe mm, get that, that trauma to not stick in there so much so it can be maybe released in some way. Um, some therapists absolutely swear by that therapy. Uh, other therapists are like, eh, I don't really believe in it. Um, but there is some really good um, evidence that shows that it, it can be uh, very helpful and can work for some folks. So EMDR, you really need to be um, trained and certified 
uh, in order to do that. So if, if you think it might be something you're interested in or somebody else you hear is interested, they need to make sure that their therapist is certified to, uh, to do that. And we actually have somebody here that is um, certified to provide EMDR to our, um, our clients. Um, somatic psychotherapy, you know, we focus on the body. Again, with DBT, this isn't anything new. It, it really, um, uh, that was already a part of this, but it's doing that whole, we ask them to do a body scan, <laughs> not where you stand in front of like a laser, you know, or whatever, but you're trying to get an awareness of your body. What's it feel like? Are you even here? What are you doing? Like, do you hear what I, are you hearing maybe the birds? Are you seeing this? Are you, what is it? Where are you at? And let's see how we can ground you if you're, you're not really particularly here. Um, and, you know, so again, grounding and um, working with parts. So, and that can be, um, another therapy that um, you're really trying to get maybe each part of the brain or um, part of the sensory that's off um, and just work with that piece. You know, it's like parting, you know, when you're parting your hair, right? You're only gonna work with this piece right here because this is the one that's affecting you. So, um, I think it's it's kind of interesting because we talk about how everything is um, integrated uh, between your physical and your emotional health. Well, it's the same. I mean, it's the same here, but sometimes we have to piece it out, and that's important. So, working with parts um, and really looking at um, where your anxiety or your, you know, the way you're feeling, where's it going? Is it traveling down your arm? Is it going to your core, your heart, you know, what, you know, what's going on? So we have to, um, uh, you know, figure that out. Uh, there's also the complementary and alternative medicines that uh, we hear about all the time now, which is yoga, um, meditation, relaxation, massage, um, let's see, uh, uh, when you go, so, man, when I, when you go to the hospital, sometimes they actually do now the, um, aromatherapy. I mean, what, are, whatever can help you, it might help you. So do it if it's in a positive way. Um, also, um, we have, uh, being, uh, using positive psychology and resiliency, uh, being positive and looking at resiliency is extremely important. So looking at how somebody has continued on, looking at their strengths, not their weaknesses, uh, is really important. Acceptance and commitment therapy, again, using like mindfulness strategies, um, Again, there's the narrative exposure therapy where you kind of are doing a timeline of all your positive and negatives so that you can really see the layout of, of your life. Uh, and then trying to, re and then trying to uh, maybe write the rest of it. Neurofeedback uh, helps uh, look at how your brain functions and uh, may help you uh, know how to regulate. There's a STAIR method. Uh, you can look that up through the veterans website. It's uh, eight total sessions, including the assessment. Uh, and it can be, it incorporates a lot of these little things. You'll notice that therapies in general can um, uh, overlap. <laughs> so some of them, they're not all that brand new. Uh, to, to say the least, and written exposure therapy. Um, so trying to write down these exposures and, um, you know, help them rewrite that for themselves. Um, for some folks with trauma, you want to, they have substance abuse issues, you want to look at um, 
uh, maybe a seeking safety um, group that is a support group for those that have substance abuse and trauma so that those, uh, so the trauma really uh, gets worked on uh, in a supportive environment that understands also the substance abuse piece. Um, and there's loads and loads of trauma, you know, work books and this and that. But one of the big things is that anything that you're doing and we're trying to change, change the brain is we're going to want to do bottom up approaches to brain change. So bottom up is, you know, you work through the body to change the brain. So bottom up. Uh, and so um, it's really uh, looking at your sensory awareness, like we've been talking about that, breathing, some poses, medications, movement-based techniques. So there are certain poses, maybe yoga, stretches, whatever, that are good for anxiety, depression, the trauma, releasing this and that. Um, but your bottom-up techniques are extremely important uh, so that if your body can tell your brain, I'm okay, I'm grounded, then your brain can go, okay, okay. I, all right, we're okay. So uh, being grounded is really important. So the roadmap for then treating trauma is, is the client connected to their body? Um, and, you know, do they experience that? Can they feel their senses? Do they understand when they're triggered? Um, if yes, great. Have them, you know, uh, maybe master those bottom-up techniques that we can show them. Um, and if they're willing to do that, great. We continue on. No, they may have to start with, you know, some lower level um, bottom up techniques to really get them grounded in that and then move up. Um, if they're not connected, you've got to start with sensory awareness. PTSD and complex trauma are all about the senses. And um, I, I can't exp express that enough. Uh, it is extremely important uh, to understand that. And that's why people are triggered over the littlest things and people don't understand. They're like, why did you think somebody just slammed a door? And nobody, it just, they just shut the door. Well, it sounds like slamming to me, you know? Um, and they're very hypervigilant, let's say. Uh, noises, forget it. Listening to music after that, forget it you know, or something, it's just too hard and um, can't problem solve then if you're, if you're being triggered everywhere. Um, so we try to work on problem solving techniques, um, resisting, you know, the urge to maybe be um, impulsive, let's say. Um, but you know, looking at how to let go of all the emotional traumas and sufferings, but really it is sensory awareness and experiencing that sensory uh, emotion with it fully. So ride the wave of anxiety and try to tell yourself you're not going to die. That's, it's, it's a rough thing. And remember that you're not your emotion. This is completely separate. Um, and you don't necessarily have to act, you know, like I'm going to go get a piece of cake. <laughs> you don't necessarily have to sit down, ride that wave of anxiety. That's making you want to go and get, you know, whatever it is that you, you think you need to get the drugs, the alcohol, um, whatever, and, um, practice respecting and loving your emotions. We all have them. It's sad that we tell men that they can't have emotions of crying, so they need to stuff it, uh, that people need to get over things like, oh, your grandmother died like two years ago and you're not over it yet. Um, those are, you know, some maybe uh, things that are quote unquote normal uh, to think about, but <clears throat> I am telling you that we in society do not realize 
fully how emotions carry us throughout our whole life, you know, um, and, and those memories are tied to it. How could it not? Think about when they do th sensory therapy with those that are in nursing homes. If you play certain music, let's say of their, their time, when maybe they were younger, all of a sudden you have people that are moving. Maybe they're talking. They're, they, they come alive or they start to remember things if you play that certain music, um, certain smells, you know, and this is, you know, you're like, oh my gosh, that smells like my grandmother's cooking. It just brings you right back home because it's a, it's a safe, wonderful place, right? That was 40 years ago. How could that be? That's how strong senses are, good or bad. They really are there. So if we can really try and understand that, we can understand how hard this work can be and to be more compassionate towards those that uh, really have to do this hard work to have some semblance of a healthy, productive life for themselves. It's a difficult thing to go through, but it can be done. So I do hope that that helps in understanding how we treat it. Again, it's very quick, but if anybody has any questions or anything, I am, I'm all done, I think, I think. <laughs> Let's see. Thank you so much. Yeah. Always informative. I appreciate you doing this. Yeah. No problem. I don't know. Ah, thank you, Harlan Jets. I move in desensitization and reprocess it. God, I couldn't remember it. Thank you. Very good. Self leadership developed by Dr. Richard Schwartz, also called, oh, IFS. Um, this is the internal family systems, yes. Mary, this was part three, and I believe there's a way to view one and two. You recorded those, right, Danielle? Yeah, I did. They're on our website at nami-northernillinois.org. Okay. Um, I could also, if you would, I think I will have your email address from being a participant in this, Mary, and I could send the recordings to you as well, if you'd like. Yeah. And I'm happy to share tonight's um, recording and slides. I have your slides from last time too. So, yeah, I mean, really, it's the same slides from last time. So, yeah, except not as in depth. Any other questions? You're welcome, Margarita. <laughs> All right. Well, if there are no questions, again, thank you all for coming and thank you, Teresa. I yeah. appreciate you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Let me know if you need anything else. Oh, I will. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. Have a good night. Oh, yeah. Oh. Har Harlan, there are three um, parts to this. Is that what you're asking? Um, we had about a dozen people here tonight. Okay. A dozen more that know about hopefully the TRC and a little bit more about trauma. For, for sure. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks all. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you.